even know when you want to go. So. Hey, Adam. Yep. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, so just give me. I just want to make sure like everybody's able to see the screen. Sure. So if everybody can hear uh, and see the presentation, uh, we're going to uh, initiate. So welcome everybody uh, to this presentation for, for Global Power BI User Group. Uh, and we want to say thank you to Adam to take the time, long time that he didn't present for us. So. He took the, some of his time and he's going to be presenting today for for our community. Thank you for that. So we just want to invite uh, everybody and give some highlights of, of the Global Power BI community. Uh, we're trying to keep up and have like one monthly session every every month. So um, and also like we count with 25 different leaders, uh, participation with different uh, leaders in the community. We are like in 20 countries plus. Uh, we have presence everywhere, and we count like with 1.5k like people uh, on Facebook. So also we have 1,000 members on LinkedIn and 400 people registered in our community, um, Power BI community. Uh, today, Adam Saxton is going to be talking about using a gateway to leverage on-premise uh, data and Power BI. Uh, for you guys that maybe don't know Adam Saxton, Adam Saxton is a uh, a senior content development focusing in the BI technology and working for Microsoft and Power BI also. And also he's the guy in the queue and he's always posting videos and, and YouTube also you can search about it and see like all the updates that uh, and all the things that he's working on. So uh, you guys can connect with us like we have a Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and Power BI and Power BI community site. So you also can register if you are not registering in our community. You can go to that link and you can register uh, in our community also to be uh, and get the latest updates. Uh, with this, basically, I'm going to uh, pass it to Adam. So Adam, can uh, you can start the presentation now. And thank you for giving us this opportunity. Awesome. Thank you. So I've, as we go through this, uh, feel free to ask questions if you have any in the chat. Um, I've got the chat off to another monitor, so I can see all of that as I'm showing stuff on my other monitor. So let me go ahead and share that. And I will try to answer the questions as they come in. Uh, if not, we'll save them for the end if we are running short on time. OK, so we are going to talk about using the gateway to leverage on-premises data. So this is really going to focus in on the on-premises data gateway. I'm going to touch on the personal gateway a little bit, but the main focus is the on-premises data gateway uh, with relation to Power BI. OK, uh, I'm going to skip this because we already talked about me. Uh, basically, I write stuff and create videos if you were confused about what senior content developer does. So I work on documentation. OK, so when we talk about the gateway, really uh, the way I look at it is we need to take a step back and really start with Power BI Desktop because there's some choices that we make when we're working with data and Power BI that we have to make up front before we ever get to the gateway itself. And when I say start with Power BI Desktop, what I'm talking about is how do we get that data into Power BI Desktop? And there's three ways to do that. One is we can import the data. So that means that we're actually pulling that data into Power BI Desktop itself. So we're taking a copy of whatever's in that data source and pulling it into Power BI Desktop. The other options that we have are direct query and live connections. Uh, some people get confused about what the difference of this is. For simplicity's sake, there's a lot more to it. But for simplicity's sake, just know that live connections are specific to analysis services, either multidimensional or tabular. And direct query are for other data sources that are not analysis services. Um, not every data source we have in Power BI is capable of direct query, but a lot of them are. And we'll show how you can tell which ones uh, are available for direct query. And so. When we use direct query or live connections, the data stays in your data source itself. So we, we're not copying that data into Power BI Desktop. We're going to query that data source 
basically live as as you're interacting with reports. We're going to make those queries. The results of the query is going to come back to visualize in the report, and then that data goes away once we're done with it. From an import data source perspective, there are a lot of data sources that are available, and there's more that are added regularly. Uh, I know we just had a announcement, I think it was earlier this week or last week, that we just uh, supported Redshift is available now in Power BI Desktop. So uh, we, we're releasing these all the time. So uh, if your data source isn't there, one thing I'll recommend right off the bat, and this is for anything Power BI related, if you have a suggestion or feedback or anything, go check out ideas.powerbi.com. So if there is a data source that you're very interested in that is not available currently and you want it to be in the service, go look at ideas.powerbi.com. It's possible that that data source is already listed in ideas that you can go vote on or that other people can vote on. And if it's not there, you can add it and let other people vote on it. So just because it's not there today doesn't mean it won't be there tomorrow. All right, so what this looks like, let's actually go jump into Power BI Desktop and take a look at it. So when we get into Power BI Desktop, we can go up top to the Get Data area to pull data in. And when we do that, I'm going to go click on More. And we'll see the list of data sources that are there. And I can scroll through all of these. There's a lot of them. So, But let me choose, let's start with SQL Server. So if I go to Connect to SQL Server, the one thing we'll see right away is this data connectivity mode. So I have a choice here of import or direct query. And if I'm doing, uh, this is the choice I have to make up front. So I either choose that I'm going to import that data into Power BI Desktop, or I'm going to choose that I want to use this from a direct query perspective. And when I do direct query, that's going to issue those live queries. So I'm making that choice up front. So that's why you have to be mindful about this before you ever get to the gateway. When you make this choice in the beginning, you may not be able to switch it. So in the case of if you've selected to import data, if you've imported data, you cannot choose to then switch it over to direct query or to a live connection. Once you've gone imported, you're stuck. Uh, you'd have to recreate the Power BI desktop file in order to do this or redo the queries that are in the uh, PBIX file itself. Let's take a look at analysis services. And here you will say that we have a see that we have an option there to connect live. So instead of saying direct query, it says connect live. Um, same thing here. If you choose import, you can't switch to connect live afterwards. The exception to this is if you choose direct query, at least for SQL Server, I haven't tried this with all of the data sources, but I would imagine it does work for other data sources, is if you choose direct query, you do get an option. It'll be down in this like lower right-hand corner. Um, you do get an option there to switch to imported, but you can't go the other way. So if you choose imported, you can't go to direct query. But for direct query, you can switch that over to import. It's a one-time thing. Um, if you make that choice, then you're, again, you're stuck in the imported mode there. So for uh, live connections with analysis services, you don't have that option. So, okay, so let's look at... And then, uh, so there was a question of, uh, so you don't recommend that. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Oh, so uh, with regards to native queries, so uh, if you want to use native queries, here, let me go back and... Uh, So native query means that you can go and add a, a statement that you want to issue directly. So if you don't want to mess around with the queries themselves or if you have a specific query that you know performs better, so that's using a native query. That's only, I don't know, is it? Yeah, I guess you can do that for import or direct query. Um, that, when we talk about gateway and refreshing and availability, that doesn't necessarily uh, impact that. What it would impact on the imported side is you're going to have, there's this concept of query folding inside of Power Query itself, and you, would have, you wouldn't be able to use uh, query folding with a native query at that point. So, so there are ramifications if you make that choice. So just be aware of that.
So, all right, let's go into. Yeah, generally you would want to use the native query. Like if you know that the query that Power Query is generating is just a bad query and it's not performant, you can use native query because you're like, look, this is a more performant query. I know exactly what I'm going to get. So, but like I said, you lose the the option of the query folding piece, which can help on the Power Query side. And you don't know with a native query also, you are not guaranteed or you don't know how many times that query is going to be issued against the data source. So there's that also. Okay, so let's talk about file locations and freshness. So when we talk about files, I'm talking about like a PBIX file or an Excel file. And you have some options when you go to get data to pull those files in. So we have a uh, option for local file. We have OneDrive for business, OneDrive personal, and then the uh, SharePoint team site as well. And so when we do local file, these are files that are on your computer itself. So this is something that's just on my hard drive or my desktop, and I want to import that into the Power BI service. And then the other options for OneDrive or for SharePoint, the SharePoint piece is SharePoint Online, so it's not SharePoint on-premises. So these are files that are in the cloud somewhere. Um, so uh, I've got it in OneDrive or I've got it in SharePoint Online. And then the, so what this location means is that for local files, we only copy the model up to the cloud. And so this is, so if we have the PBIX file, we're taking the reports and the, there's a model file that's inside the PBIX. And this is the actual data container. Think of it like almost like an analysis services backup that's inside of the PBIX file. So you could rename PBIX to zip and go look through the file and see these items. Um, and then you could do the same for an Excel file as well. And you'll see like an item.data file inside of it. That's the data model. So that's that's the actual, like think of that as like the Power Pivot model or the analysis services database that's inside of these files. And from a data set perspective, we take that item.data and we put that into the cloud and that's hosted in our data center at that point. And so we'll actually load that data model into one of our analysis services backend servers. And then the, well, if there are reports for a PBIX perspective, we take the reports as well and the connection information, but I don't necessarily care about the PBIX itself or I don't care about the, uh, the Excel file itself. So I care about that data model more than anything else. Um, so for Excel, there are also uh, some options too where it will take worksheets. Uh, but from for the purposes of this discussion and when we're talking about the gateway, we're talking about that the data model that's inside of the file. And then for files in the cloud, the model is copied to the Azure BI backend, similarly to how the local files work. The difference with when it's in OneDrive or SharePoint is that if you make changes to that file on on your machine. So for the local files, if I make changes to that Excel file, I'm disconnected from Power BI. So Power BI is not going to know about those changes. Whereas if they're in OneDrive or SharePoint, we actually pull the original file that's in, because it's in the cloud, we know how to get to it. So we go look at it and we check to see if it changed. And if it changed, we pull those changes into the Power BI service. And that happens about every hour or so. And so you could theoretically, if you make a change to the report, or you open up the PBIX file on your desktop, refresh the data, save it back to OneDrive, Power BI will pick that up. So that's an option that you have to actually refresh your data without ever needing to use a gateway at all. Okay, so we've got our data, it's in Power BI desktop, and we publish that to the Power BI service. So it's now in the cloud. So now how do we deal with refresh and live connections and all of that, that has to do with the gateways itself. So that's where the gateways actually come in. And so one of the questions that you have to ask is, how do you want to refresh that data? So for imported, we our option is that we do schedule refresh at that point. And so that can be hourly or daily, depending on uh, what's available to you and how you want to, uh, how fresh do you want that data. From a performance perspective, this is with regards to when a user is interacting with the report. And so when I click on a, or select like a bar in a bar chart and it's interacting with that report, if I'm doing schedule refresh, the end user is not really gonna see any difference. It happens in the background. They don't know that it's happening and there are no perceivable performance delays. 
um, on the direct query or live connection, we talked about this, this is real time, so I'm issuing those queries. So depending on how fast the data source responds or how much latency there is there, you may see an actual la uh, a delay in uh, those reports actually picking up. Uh, so there was a question out there, so if I'm using OneDrive file, or if, I, if my file's on OneDrive, then I don't need the gateway, is that right? Technically you don't, um, but you have to open up the the Power BI, you have to open the file up in Power BI Desktop and then you know refresh the data manually, save it back. So it's not as nice as it would be if you could do like schedule refresh or you're doing direct query or live connection, but it is an option. Like if you don't have a pro license so you can't use the gateways to do this, then that's an option for you. I do know that there are some tools out there that can maybe get you around this whole thing in terms of automating some of that. So you can maybe go search the internet and go find that stuff. Uh, but uh, you, you do not need a gateway if you're going that route. Um, so data storage. So with an imported data set, and I've got, um, it's my PBIX file. I've imported the data into PBIX. And I publish that to the Power BI service. However big that data model is, that's being stored in our data center. And that goes against your data capacity. D does everyone know what I mean by data capacity? If anyone in the chat can go, does anyone not know what data capacity is? Okay, let's take a look at data capacity real quick because I want to make sure you understand that. So data capacity is if I go up to this gear icon and I have this manage personal storage. So for a free user, I have one gig of space. For a, uh, for a pro user, you have 10 gig of space. And so if I have an imported data set and I publish that to the Power BI service and say it's 100 meg, the data model is 100 meg, that goes against this personal storage limit. That's, that's what we, when we say data capacity, that's what we're talking about. And so your PBIX files can have a, they have each individual data set has a limit of one gigabyte for imported data sets. And so in this case, I could potentially have 10 data sets that were each one gig in size before I hit my cap. And so that's something to think about when you're importing data set. And that's also where it comes into question of uh, people asking like, well, when do I know when it's the right time to go direct query or live connections? And the answer there is for direct query and live connection, there's no limit on that because your data is not stored in the cloud. It's, it's stored in your data source. And so your limit is whatever your on-premises data source can handle and or whatever throughput you have that is uh, handling the amount of users going through and whatnot. So you have different things to worry about when you're going through a live connection or direct query. You don't have to worry about that data size. Data size still will be taken up from reports and other things, but it's not as significant as what the data model would take up. From a row level security perspective, we have uh, for imported data, source, uh, data sources and for direct query, you can do what we have. We have cloud-based row level security that you can set up. You define those roles in Power BI Desktop, and then you set that up. Uh, you assign people to those roles with inside of the service when you uh, set security on a data source. And then for analysis services, you do whatever you would normally do for on-premises analysis services if you're using a live connection. So it supports row level security, security natively. Power BI honors that, and we'll we'll come back to how that works in, in a little bit. Okay, so this is the part where I said I'll, I'll touch on the personal gateway a little bit. So the personal gateway is available for you if you are not necessarily setting up. This is, look, I've got my own data set. I'm publishing this to the Power BI service, and I just want to refresh that on my own. I don't want to deal with overhead of managing anything, or no one else is going to use this. It's just me. Then the personal gateway is a great way to go. Um, this is something that you can use. You can install it locally on your laptop or um, you know whatever workstation that you're working on, and it'll just run, and you can set up schedule refresh with it. So the one thing to be aware of is that in order for schedule refresh to work with this, the machine has to be on that's hosting the personal gateway. So if you shut off your machine, obviously Power BI, it, it can't talk with Power BI, so that's going to be a problem. So, but the the other thing is you can only do schedule refresh with the personal gateway. You can't use direct query or live connections with the personal gateway. So the uh, the way you install the personal gateway is actually we have one gateway install, and I'll come back to that in a little bit, and I'll talk about how you install personal versus the on-premises data gateway. Okay. So the on-premises data gateway. 
This is if you want to have a centralized gateway that multiple users can take advantage of. Um, the idea there is that I define a gateway in a data source. So as an admin, I'm setting up a, a data source and I'm entering in credentials that are used for that data source. I don't want to give those to my end users, but they can publish a PBIX file and then we will match that up in the service and they could take advantage of that either from a schedule refor resource, sorry, schedule refresh perspective or they can use it for direct query and live connections, but they don't have to worry about it. it, it it'll just work assuming everything lines up. And the other nice thing about the on-premises data gateway too is that it's used with more than just Power BI. And so we work with Power Apps, Microsoft Flow, Azure Logic Apps. It's not on this slide, but it also is used with Azure Analysis Services as well. And so you can have one gateway and use it with all of these services. So the, the difference being is that for Power BI, we set up data sources and the data sources that we set up in Power BI are not shared with the other services. So those are only used within Power BI itself, but the gateway itself can be used with those other services. So, and then on-premises data gateway, or sorry, the on-premises data gateway, you can use live connections and direct query with. That's the only option for you to use that. And you can have multiple gateways on-premises data gateways in your environment. So even as a single user like myself, I can install multiple on-premises data gateways. You can only have one on a given machine, but I can have multiple in the environment, or I can be the admin of multiple on-premises data gateways if I need to be. So, okay, so differences between this, I think we touched on some of it already. Um, the on-premises data gateway is focused more on the admin side of things. So a centralized IT admin can go in and, and set these up and manage users and uh, you know have that available for users within their organization. Whereas the personal gateway is all about you and it's you set it up, you use it, and it works for your items. It's not something that can be used by other people. Um, schedule refresh is only available in personal gateway. Um, also, there's no central monitoring or control of the personal gateway. Uh, for the on-premises data gateway, you do have the ability to, to manage users and whatnot, and down the road there will be more options in terms of uh, usage information and just auditing and things of that nature. Um, so that's coming. And then for the personal gateway, that's only for Power BI, and then the on-premises da data gateway is used for more than just Power BI. All right, before we get into that, let's look at, uh, let's see here, just make sure we don't have anything pending. Um, so there is a question in there, uh, how many different client-specific queries are supported by an on-prem gateway? If we have several hundred different clients, we'd like to use our on-prem data through the gateway. Do we need one per client to filter their data out? So uh, it's a good question. I, I'm not sure necessarily what you mean by clients if you're referring to like ISVs. So the on-process data gateway is tied when you actually, uh, let me show you. So when I, either when I install the on-premises data gateway on premises, or when I go in to manage it, one thing you'll notice here is that I have to go in and sign in for the gateway. So when I sign in, I'm signing in with my organization account. So this is tied to my tenant. So of MFA, which is sometimes annoying. So I got to type it in. And so when I do this, the only people that can make use of this gateway are people that are in my tenant. And so if you're in a uh, like an ISV type situation where you have people outside of your organization, they're not going to be able to use this on-premises data gateway. They would have to set up a gateway in their own tenant. Um, so that's that's how that would work. Now you can set it up in a way if you're managing like you have maybe multiple internal groups inside of your organization. This on-premises data gateway, as long as it has access to the data sources, you can define multiple data sources within the gateway. There's technically no upper limit on how many data sources you can have within the gateway itself. So um, we'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little more uh, when we walk through like how to actually set those up. So. In this case, I've actually got the on-premises data gateway installed. This is the box I have it installed on. When you go to install it, I'm not going to walk through the installer, but there's a choice in the beginning 
You can choose on-premises data gateway or personal. So the way you get that is by going to the downloads and you'll see data gateway. So there's only one download. But when you run that, you'll have a choice of either personal or on-premises data gateway. I say that and there's actually some smoke and mirrors going on there. You only get that choice if you go to install it if you downloaded it from Power BI. So like I said, you can use this the on-premises data gateway with multiple services. So if you happen to go to Power Apps and you download the gateway there, you'll never have the choice to choose personal or on-premises data gateway. And so what you're actually downloading from the Power BI server is actually a stub file that only has that selection of personal and on-premises data gateway. If you choose on-premises data gateway, it's gonna go get the binary for the on-premises data gateway. If you choose personal, it's going to get the installer binary for the personal gateway. And so that's only available on the Power BI side, so that's why you only see it if you download it from Power BI. Um, so if I download that, it's actually downloading, it's called like Power BI Gateway.msi or something like that. Um, and so if you download it from Power Apps and you don't see that personal option, that's why. So, okay, so after I've installed the on-premises data gateway and I signed in, when I sign into the on-premises data gateway, that registers that gateway with the Power BI service because I'm logging into my tenant, my organization, and it's reaching out to the gateway service saying, hey, I'm available now. And this is the user that owns me. The user that signs in is the default admin of that gateway. The minute I do that, I can go up to the gear and I can select manage gateways. So Manage Gateways is going to list all of your on-premises data gateways. Do not confuse this with the personal gateway. You will not see personal gateways here. I've actually had that question before of like, why don't I see my personal gateway under Manage Gateways? It's misleading. You will only see the on-premises data gateways listed here. You'll see the personal gateway when you go to select uh, like schedule refresh or something like that. So, Let's go ahead and choose Manage Gateways. When we go there, we're going to see a list. I only have one gateway installed, but you would see multiple gateways here if, if you had multiple gateways, so I only have the one. You're going to see a gateway setting screen, which lets you give it a name. You can see if it's online. You can give some, some metadata type information. The other thing you're going to see is administrators when you've selected the gateway itself. So like I said, you can have multiple administrators for this gateway. Right now I only have one, but I can add multiple users in here. The minute I add another user in here, they will see it when they go to manage gateways at that point. And then that's it from a gateway perspective. From a data source perspective, you can have multiple data sources under a gateway for different data or for different data source types. And so I've got some in here for SQL, I've got analysis services. Um, you can have, let's just go add a data source and we'll see the list of so these are all the data sources that are available for the on-premises data gateway. So you can see there's a bunch of them. It's not all of them that you can do in Power BI Desktop, but um, it is a majority of them. So if you don't see it here and you're looking to do schedule refresh, chances are it'll work with the personal gateway, but these are the only data sources that are currently supported with the on-premises data gateway. And we do have a table listing in the gateways documentation about what is available for schedule refresh and what is available for um, uh, direct query and live connection or direct query live connections only AS. And then uh, you can also see the listing of what data sources are available for personal and on premises. We have a listing of all of that in the documentation. And so when I choose one of these data sources, I can give it a name and then I can give the server information. The server and database is very important. And so this has to match what you put into Power BI Desktop. And so whatever server name I put in when I connect to the data source in Power BI Desktop, it has you have to put in the same information here in the gateway. And so if I put in the server, the NetBio service name, I have to put in the NetBio service name here. If I put in the, the fully qualified domain name for my SQL server, I've got to put in the fully qualified domain name here. Um, I had a customer one time where they said that, hey, uh, the gateway's not showing up. I, I know that it's a, you know, I'm using it for this data source, but uh, I don't see it. And it turned out that in Power BI Desktop, they had to use the IP address. But then in the gateway setup for the data source inside of the service, they put in the machine name. And that doesn't match. They have to be the same. So you either have to put the IP address in both locations, or you have to put in the server name in both location. So... 
Just be aware of that. Same thing for the database. It is not case sensitive, but just that's one of the things, that's the first thing I go look at if someone tells me, hey, I'm not seeing the gateway. It's either not available in schedule refresh or it's showing up as saying it's not available when I do direct query or live connection. And the first thing I go check is, does the server name and database match what's in Power BI Desktop? Um, so that, that's the very first thing I go look at. Uh, then you can also choose, depending on the data source, you can choose the authentication method. So for SQL Server, basic is going to be SQL auth. Windows is Windows authentication. And then if I choose one of those, I enter in the username and password. For direct query connections, this, the username and password that I specify here is the credential that will be used to access that data source. So if I have a direct query report, everyone that hits, all the users in Power BI that hit that, are going to use the same credential when hitting SQL Server. So it's not going to take advantage of, you're not going to be able to see any type of auditing or anything on the backend SQL Server. Um, if you were interested in using like the real level security stuff that's in SQL Server 2016, you can't do that right now. Um, there are some things that are being worked on to help enable scenarios like that, but it's not available yet. Um, so right now, just be aware for direct query and for schedule refresh. It will always use this credential that you type in when connecting to the data source. Um, we'll come back to how this works with analysis services, um, but just know that you do have to enter in a username and password for analysis services as well. And then I'll talk about what settings you need to be aware of there for uh, using live connections in a second. Uh, the other option here, if you guys are familiar with uh, privacy modes, or privacy levels, under advanced, you can select that per data source with inside of the service. So you have three options, technically you have four, but um, it's organizational, private, or public. I'm not gonna go into privacy levels here, but just know that you can set those for the data. It's a data source setting within the gateway. Okay, so let's look at one that I've already got set up. Uh, yep, we're gonna discard that. So I've already got one that's set up, uh, that's connected. It's showing connection successful, that's great. Uh, the other thing, so I, I talked about that the first thing that I look at is uh, the uh, server name and database name. Make sure those match between Power BI Desktop and the data source. If people are saying, hey, the gateway is, doesn't show up. The second thing I check for is, okay, are the users listed in this area? So if you publish a Power BI Desktop file and you're not the admin, or actually even if you are the admin of the gateway, if your account is not listed here, it will not show the gateway, the on-premises data gateway for you. So if you go into schedule refresh and you say, hey, it's not, I only see the personal gateway, it could be because you're not in the user list of that data source. It's per data source. So just be aware of that, that they, the users who are publishing the reports need to be in this list. The consumers of the reports do not need to be in this list, but whoever's publishing that PBIX file, they need to be in this list in order to take advantage of the on-premises data gateway. That's the second thing I look for if they say, you can't, I, I don't see the gateway. Um, so these data sources, they all look kind of the same. So for analysis services, same thing, it's just different data source. I still have a server and database name. I still have the users tab, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. So from, from a schedule refresh perspective, let me see, let's pull up one here. So the way I would get to that is if I go to the data sets, and I'm using the preview mode of the new GUI layout, so if this doesn't look familiar to you, it's because you don't have the preview stuff enabled. So this is the new layout that's gonna be coming eventually. It's in preview right now. Um, I'm still getting used to it myself, so uh, you can turn that on uh, if you want to. It's a uh, setting that you can go into to change that. Um, but for the data sets, I can go into the settings and I, I, I can choose the ellipse and then I can choose settings to go in to manage my schedule refresh pieces. And so from a gateway connection, so you'll see here right now it's saying, hey, I don't have a gateway available to me. Um, I thought I corrected that. I'm not sure why it's actually not doing that yet. I would have to go back through and figure that out. Um, if the gateway, if everything did line up, you would see the gateway here. You could choose this radio dial and you may see multiple gateways there if there are more than one that have that data source available and you have access to it and you'd select which gateway you wanna do. Uh, the other difference here is if you're using the on-premises data gateway, the data source credentials piece here would be grayed out because those credentials are managed in the on-premises data gateway. Um, but for the personal gateway, you have to enter those into that, so. So you make this gateway selection here for schedule refresh. 
uh, this is an imported data set. Uh, this other data set I have is a, using an AS Live connection, and you'll see that there is no gateway options available for me because it's a live connection, so I don't, I don't have an option of schedule refresh. Okay, so one other thing I wanted to point out, uh, this comes up, this came up a few times, so if I go back to manage gateways, uh, some people, I, I got a, someone pinged me one time and said, hey, I, I can't remove a data source or I can't remove a gateway, and I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, oh, when I click on it, I, like, there's no option here to remove it. And there actually is, if you look really close, let me zoom in, there's this ellipse, so when you highlight over it, there's an ellipse you can select. It's a little hard to see, and the person I was dealing with was, uh, they had uh, vision blindness. I don't know if it was specifically color blindness or something else, um, but they couldn't actually see that because the colors were so close together that they, they'd never noticed it. And honestly, even when I look at it, it's a little, I know it's there, so I know to look for it, but it kind of blends in a little bit. So when I select that, I have the option to remove. Um, that's the same, that's true for the gateway as well. So on the gateway side, if I select that, I actually have an option there to add a data source or remove it. Whereas I also have an option, if I have the gateway selected, I can choose add data source up top as well, but I don't have an option to remove anywhere. So I've given that feedback to the engineering team to say, hey, maybe we want to change that a little bit. Just be aware that it is there. So if you're not seeing it, there's an ellipse. All right. Let's move on. So let's talk about live connections with analysis services. So a couple things. We talked about the uh, username and password that you have to enter in for the analysis services data source under Manage Gateways. That account has to be an admin on the analysis services. So it has to be inside of the analysis services instance. You have to list that account as a server admin. So it has to be in that role, it has security. So that basically means this account has full control over that instance. And the reason for that is because when we use live connections, we make use of effective username in the connection string. And the only accounts that can use effective username are server admins with inside of analysis services. So that's a requirement that we have. Also that, that analysis services has to be on a domain join machine. So it has to be on a domain. It can't be a just a workstation. And so what will happen is, is whatever user that I've signed in with, so in my case it's asaxton at kindacube.com, when I go use a, a report that uses a live connection, it will take my email address, which is actually a user principal name, it takes that and it puts that into the effective username property of the connection string. And then that gets passed down. So I actually physically connect to analysis services with whatever the username and password was I set up for the data source. And then it notices the effective username in the connection string, and it says, hey, I'm going to act on behalf of this user. So basically, I'm impersonating whatever the user is for that effective username. And then that email address has to match a UPN in your local domain. So UPN is a property on a domain account, so this is also why you have to be domain joined. Um, also, the fact effective username requires that you be domain joined. Um, but that email address has to match a UPN in your domain. And I've run into situations where the UPNs that they're using on premises are not their email addresses. And so they may have, like at Microsoft, we have different domains. So I could be, I'm technically in the North America domain. And if my UPN was like asaxon at northamerica.microsoft.com, my email address is asaxon at microsoft.com they would not match. And so you would end up getting an error message similar to what's on the slide, which is the username and password is incorrect, which is very helpful and tells you exactly what the problem is. But it could be because that UPN, typically whenever I see this error, I'm like, your UPN doesn't match. Like, that's the first thing we go for. And we have to validate that. There are things you can do in your environment to make sure that your accounts are copied up to Azure Active Directory, um, because there is a difference between Azure Active Directory and your local domain. So Power BI only cares about Azure Active Directory. Um, it doesn't know anything about your local on-premises domain unless you're actually using like Azure AD DirSync or like through the Azure AD Connect tool and copying those accounts to Azure Active Directory, then they would match up. Um, Another option you have in your environment is you can set up what's called an alternate UPN suffix on accounts. And so you could say, hey, I want to switch these over to be this UPN so they match what's in Power BI. Most organizations fight that option. Like they don't want to do that because it doesn't, that they, 
they they have other th- policies in place for their organization, so they're like, no, we're not going to do that. So the other option we have is if you go into the data source for analysis services specifically, you'll only see this with analysis services. And if you go to the users tab, you'll see an option here called map usernames. And what this does is I can say, hey, I've got uh, effective username. I can say, hey, replace whatever is on the Power BI side. And instead, if it's that user for the replace, I want to send this instead for the effective username. So for example, I could do, I could do a, oops, in a cube.com, a saxonet microsoft.com. And so what this is saying is, hey, I'm logged in with ASAX and a Gynacube, but my gateway is actually installed on a Microsoft domain join machine. And so I want to say, hey, this is what I'm actually going to pass for that user. So that way it does match with an account in their local Active Directory. And so that's a way you can get around it as well. A couple things with this is I can, this is a simple string replace. So I could do something like this also. I can say... I can say, hey, if their email address has at guy in a cube in it, I want to replace that with at Microsoft.com. So this would cover everyone in that domain. And I could add multiples of these if I have multiple domains. Another option we have is I can just put in asterisk. Now, everyone wants to know, is like, oh, could I do something like asterisk or like at g asterisk.com or whatever, and it's going to pick up all those domains. No, I can only put asterisks by itself. So this means every user is going to get whatever I put in for the with. So you're basically saying ignore the individual users. I just want to pass one UPN for everyone. So you may have a scenario where you don't necessarily care about auditing or anything, or you have specific requirements in your organization where this may be possible. Um, I will tell you, typically, we don't implement something like this unless there's an actual need for it. So someone had a scenario where they needed this. Um, it may not fit with what your organization does, but it is something that's available, so just be aware of that. Um, whenever you create these rules and you apply those, uh, it may take up to 15 minutes or so for them to take effect, so be aware of that as well. And then let's go make sure there's no other questions here. Uh, can we programmatically set up that mapping? The answer to that is no. There's no way to do that programmatically through APIs or anything currently. Um, I'm actually not aware of uh, any items on the roadmap for that. So if that's something you're interested in, I would say go out to ideas.powerbi.com and see if something's out there for that or to enter that yourself and get people to vote it up. Um, so that it is available. So right now, today, it's not. So the, let's see, let's go back to, uh, so you're not, uh, okay, so you're not clear about map username. So the idea here is that we will send by default whatever you're signed in with. So in my case, it's asaxon at guyinacube.com. So let's take a scenario where, let me, a second, let me pull this up. So this command prompt is on my laptop. Uh, what you're seeing in the Power BI stuff is in a VM. And they're in two different domains. So this, this is on my laptop that's on a Microsoft domain. So if I say, who am I, slash UPN, this will tell me what my UPN is of my currently logged in user. And in this case, it should come back with ASACs and at Microsoft.com, which it does. So that's my UPN for my currently logged in user. So if I install the on-premises data gateway on my laptop and I sign in with ASACs and at Gynacube.com when I install it, when I go to use an AS Live connection, it's going to pass ASACs and at Gynacube through the gateway to my analysis services, but at that point, it's on the Microsoft domain. It's not on the guy in a cube.com domain. So I'm going to get an error on that. It's not going to work. It's going to tell me username or password's incorrect because the email address doesn't match what my actual user UPN is. So there's no account in my domain for ASACs and a guy in a cube.com. In my case, it's ASACs and at Microsoft.com. So what I can do to get around that is I can say, hey, I want to replace guyinacube.com with asaxon at microsoft.com. And then I can add that in there. So now, if we theoretically say 
my email address that I'm coming in, the original name is asaxon at guyinthecube.com, what's going to be passed to the gateway for effective username? And it's going to be that value. So asaxon at microsoft.com. So in that case, it would work because asaxon at microsoft.com does match a local account in the local domain where the gateway is installed. And so that would be successful. So that's what map usernames is for, is if you have, so a, another good example of where this comes in handy, um, I've had people that will set up a trial tenant um, in like Office 365. When you do that, you get an email address of, you know, user at tenantname.onmicrosoft.com. Well, that email address doesn't exist. There is no dom local domain for that. And so if I wanted to test that, the gateway in Microsoft.com for that domain or for that tenant, I'd have to use map usernames to replace the on Microsoft.com email address with my whatever my local domain is. So that's another reason why this would come in handy for you. So, okay. Let's go back to. Okay, so we talked about this. All right, so how does this all work? What happens is first is we're going to install and configure the gateway. That's going to be on an on-premises machine. This is in your environment. This uh, this technically could be in an Azure VM, but in that case, even though it's technically in Azure, I still consider that on-premises because you're installing it on a Windows machine. Um, and then at that point, you're going to log in with that. You're going to register it with the service, and then it's in your environment ready to use. At that point, you're going to go to PowerBI.com. You're going to go to Manage Gateways. You're going to create the data sources under the gateway, and then optionally, you can also set up Schedule Refresh if you have an imported data set. Then at that point, if we interact with a report or schedule refresh or we select refresh now, that's going to trigger that something needs to go use the gateway. So the Power BI service is going to add something to, is going to signal to the gateway service that we have something to do. And then the gateway service is going to actually add that to a queue in Azure Service Bus. So Azure Service Bus is really where all the magic happens. What happens is that the gateway will actually is actually sitting there pulling this queue in Azure Service Bus, waiting for a request, and it will pick up that request when it's when it lands into the queue, and then the gateway takes it and we will we'll, we will decrypt the credentials. So when you add in your username and password into that data source, those credentials get encrypted, and they are those credentials that encrypted blob is stored in the gateway service. So we have a credentials database; it's stored there, and then we don't have the actual key to decrypt that in the cloud. The key to decrypt that is actually sitting on the gateway itself. And so it will pass, the gateway service in that request will pass to the service bus the encrypted blob for those credentials that gets passed to the gateway. The gateway takes that request and will decrypt the credentials on premises. It does not happen in the cloud. At that point, the gateway will connect using the connection string information and your credential that it decrypted. It'll connect to your data source and will run whatever the query is as part of the request. And then it will get the results back and send that back up to the stack, at which point it will either refresh the data model in the cloud or it will show those results in the report for if you're using a live query or direct query connection or a live connection. So that's, that's how it works. That's the magic of it. So a few other things I want to show you here before we get into the all the actually no let's do it as part of the troubleshooting because it'll tie into that. So uh, in terms of troubleshooting the gateway, I already talked about a few things in terms of like if you don't see the gateway showing up, like things to go check. There are a couple of things. Uh, one thing I didn't mention uh, for schedule refresh, the top three things I go to look at are one: does the server name and database name match what's in Power BI Desktop and what's defined in the data source. Are, is the user that's publishing the PBIX listed in the users tab of the data source? Those are the two things we covered. The third thing is uh, do, shoot, I lost it. What was the third thing? Uh, so we've got server name, database name, we've got users tab. Oh yeah, if you have multiple data sources in your Power BI desktop, so say I'm connecting to SQL Server and I'm mashing that up with data from analysis services or an ODBC connection. All of the data sources that are that reside in that Power BI desktop file have to be represented in the gateway in order for that gateway to show up for schedule refresh. And so if I've only added the data source for SQL Server, 
then I will never see that data source of, I will never see the gateway available when I go to schedule refresh. If I also had a data source to analysis services, I would have to have both the analysis services data source and the SQL data source defined in the gateway for that to show up in the schedule refresh. So be aware of that. Okay, so troubleshooting firewall. Let's talk. Uh, I'll also say slash proxy. Um, there are uh, a lot of people ask me is like, hey, what ports do I need to open up in my firewall to allow inbound communication? And the answer is none, because the gateway uses outbound communication. The gateway is what establishes the connection to Azure Service Bus. It is an outbound connection from your environment. Power BI is never the one to initiate, or Azure Service Bus never initiates the connection into your environment. It's the gateway that reaches out to Azure Service Bus. And there are different ports that are used as part of this. The majority of it's 443, but for Azure Service Bus, we do use some ports that are not 443. Um, all of the data is encrypted over the wire using SSL, but they're not all over port 443. So some people say, hey, you're not using 443, you're not encrypting, you're not using SSL. We are using SSL and TLS, but we are doing it over port 443. Um, so some people have some restrictions in their environment that they can only do outbound 443 traffic. Um, also, we've had issues where the uh, so typically in this scenario we will initially connect using the fully qualified domain name to Azure Service Bus, but subsequent requests after that will actually be with the IP address. And so we just had an update that came out for the gateway that takes care of some of this. So let's look at network. And so there's a couple things here. First off, in the gateway, when you go pull up the gateway on the gateway machine. Um, under the network tab, you're going to see local network status. So first off, you can see, is it connecting to basically Azure Service Bus at this point? Um, and it's for me, it's saying, yes, it connected. So right away, you're going to be able to tell, is this actually working or is it not? And so you, you, can, you can see that in the, uh, the GUI configurator. The other thing here is this Azure Service Bus connectivity mode. Before, I used to tell people, we have this uh, gateway core configuration file. And I'll, I'll show that in a little bit, because there's still a reason why you would want to go to that. But there's a setting in there where you can force HTTPS for communication for Azure Service Bus. And what that does is it forces all communication over 443. We now have a setting here where you can set that. So you don't have to go to the config file, which is awesome. The other thing this will do is it will actually force communication over the fully qualified domain name as well. So we'll never use the IP address because the only time we use the fully qualified domain name is over 443. And so just be aware that this is a way that you can force the 443 traffic instead of those other non-standard ports that I showed. Um, we do have a note here that it could, it may cause slow performance. I, you're going to have to test that and see what that means for your environment. I don't have any numbers for you or any baselines. Typically, when it comes to performance, I always say, what's your baseline that you were expecting? And then compare based off of that, because I don't know what it should be for your environment. Because um, there's a lot of factors that come in play there in terms of latency, where the gateway is, where the data source is, uh, all sorts of things. So um, I, I don't know what that means. You may not see any performance degradation by using this, but just know that you may. And you may want to validate that through tracing of some kind. All right, we'll come back to the rest of this in a second. Uh, the, actually, before I go, so I, I said that this was also about the proxy as well. So one thing, if you have a proxy, nine times out of 10, if you have a proxy and you're having an issue, the gateway by default uses a service SID for the login account for the services for the Windows service on the machine. And so this is not a domain account. And typically what I found is that the uh, if we set the service account for the gateway to a domain account, that gets it working with the proxy. So before we had to go through a bunch of steps to do that. It wasn't just change it in services. But now you can do that through the gateway configurator. So you can actually change the service account right here. And it'll take care of everything for you, which is awesome. So it's just one step now. You can also optionally restart the gateway from here as well. Okay. So that's firewall and proxy. 
Uh, we also have a bunch of tools that are available for you. So always make sure you're on the latest version of the gateway um, that is available. So uh, there were some changes also in this that I believe it will tell you if there is an update. You can see the version number in that GUI configurator now. That's new for the on-premises data gateway. So just always make sure you're on the latest version. You can check refresh history for schedule refresh. We have event logs available for both the personal gateway and the on-premises data gateway that's available for you. Trace logs for the gateway. Trace logs are the first thing I go to when I have issues. So if I go to the diagnostics tab on this GUI, one thing you'll see here is this gateway logs. And you can export those logs. They'll put them in a zip file on your desktop, and you can, you can go look at those and see what's going on. The other thing you can do here is you can enable what's called verbose logging, or we call them level five logging. Uh, we have documentation that says shows you how to enable this from the config files themselves, but now you can do this through the, the GUI configurator to get more information on this. Uh, one thing that you'll get if you enable the level five logging is you'll actually see performance related information on the queries that are being issued. So you'll see how long of a duration that query took. So that's one thing you can do there. Now, a reason why you'd still need to go to that gateway config file, let me pull that up. So it's under the gateway folder, and it is called, it's a really long name, so I just call it the gateway core config file. So it's this guy right here. It's a really long, last part of it's gateway core. So if I open that up and go all the way down, so I'll show you real quick. This is the setting for the Azure Service Bus HTTPS. You just change that auto detect to HTTPS, but you can do it through the GUI now, so you don't have to worry about it. The other setting that is here is, where is it? One more. Go. Oh, there it is. So it's this emit query trace. By default, it's set to false. You can set that to true, and that will actually list in the log the actual queries that the gateway is issuing to your data source. So if you want to see that in combination with the level five, you can actually, it's almost like a profiler almost. So you're going to see the queries that are being issued and you can see the performance time for those queries. So uh, that's just, if you want to dig in a little bit, uh, you can get information that way. So, okay. All right. Um, other tools that are available for us is uh, performance counters. The on-premises data gateway does have performance counter information. Um, this is more general information, like how many connections are there, how many queries am I issuing, uh, but you can use that in combination with other things to see, engage, like is my gateway getting overloaded? Do I maybe need to set up another gateway and maybe offload some things to make it more performance? Um, uh, I talked about proxy uh, and setting the account there. We also have uh, documentation about how to actually set up a specific proxy if you have other requirements. Fiddler is a great tool for troubleshooting HTTP traffic. It can also decrypt uh, the HTTPS traffic on the fly for you. So if you want to dig in a little more, that's available for you as well. We also have a great troubleshooting article for the on-premises data gateway with uh, on the documentation site that goes through a lot of stuff. It also has information of how you can do the, uh, how you use the perf counters, how you can actually line up the uh, performance tracing with the level five logging and the emit query stuff. So that's all available for you as well. And so with that, that is the end of my prepared content. Let's see what questions we have here. Uh, so I will I will make sure that the presentation the slides get out so you can get those. I will take that action, and then I'll probably stick it up on SlideShare and send out the link. Oh, I'll stick it in the uh, the Facebook group, and then uh, like Vishal or someone can get it out to you uh, if you're not on the Facebook group. So any other questions about the gateway? Um, feel free to unmute yourself if you can if you want if you want to talk instead of type. I know I covered a lot of stuff, and I may have not covered something you wanted to hear about with it, but. All right, uh, so I'm asked to give the URLs, which should be allowed to access in server via internet for the gateway. Um, so we do have the URLs available on the documentation site. Uh, so let me do, do, do. do. So on gateways, on-premises data gateway, we have a port section here, so let me put that in the chat. So 
these are the URLs that we use. So this was what was in the slides also. Um, and we say what ports we use for those items. Um, if you're using, so if you're not forcing HTTPS and we do the IP addresses, that is the Azure IP whitelist that you need to go look at. And part of the trouble there that people complain about is that um, that IP address, it's like an XML file on the download center and you've got to go manually update that in your environment. It gets released once a week and it can change. And so it's kind of a pain. And so you can force the HTTPS on the Azure service bus to avoid that now. Um, that was a huge ask from a lot of customers. So, um, but just be aware that if you're not forcing HTTPS, you have to deal with the Azure IP whitelist. And we do have a link for that uh, right here under the port section, so there it is that. Also be aware that the IP list that's in that document is in the CIDR format, so that does not mean that address. So just be aware that it's you may have to pay attention to the range of IPs that are actually available. So good question. Uh, might be off topic, but can you give some tips on improving direct query performance? to an on-premises environment of things to look at besides reducing columns. Yeah, so for direct query, um, and I would say this is true for live connection as well, in terms of performance, first thing I'm gonna do is go look at like normal performance uh, performance testing for my, or uh, tracing for my data source. So for like SQL Server, I'm gonna go run a profiler trace. For analysis services, I'm gonna go run a profiler trace. And make sure that it's not the query itself. If it's query performance, you have a couple options in terms of you can do for like SQL at least, you can enter in the native query that it uses so you can write a more performant query. Um, you can actually do that for analysis services as well uh, if you wanna write MDX or DAX. And then the uh, outside of that, it may be tuning on your data source itself. So maybe it's an index issue or something you need to go do. Um, outside of that, you could be running into latency. We are going over the internet. So there's a lot of things at play there. Um, there are some things in your environment, uh, if you want dedicated throughput to Microsoft data centers, take a look at an option called Express Route. You do have to pay for it. It is not, uh, I don't know what the actual pricing is, but I can't imagine it's cheap. Um, it's meant for an organization that wants a dedicated pipe to a data center. And there are certain SLAs we have on uh, data source throughput. Power BI does honor uh, Express Route. We have an article for Express Route. Um, the Gateway also honors Express Route. Um, the other thing I will say is in terms of placement of the gateway, you want to get the gateway as close to your data source as possible. So ideally, the closest you can actually get to the data source is on the data source machine itself. So if I have a SQL server, I would install the gateway on the SQL server itself. Now, I'm not advocating that you should do that because there's a lot of scenarios where that's probably not the best thing to do because you want your SQL server to be alone. You don't want anything else messing with it or AS for that matter. Um, but I, I will say that that's the closest you can get. So you're gonna, you're gonna get rid of any network latency potentially between the gateway and the data source itself by doing that. Otherwise, if you don't wanna put it on that machine, put it on a machine that's at least in the same subnet, so you're not um, you're not going to be going through all these different routers and stuff in your environment. So that'll reduce latency. Um, the other thing is that if you want, uh, let me go back to, if you're familiar with, I've talked about this in other uh, spots, but you can figure out what data center. Power BI is listed in. So if you go to the question mark and go to about, you'll see what data store um, your Power BI is using. So this is the data center that we're in. So in my case, the guy in a cube tenant is based in West US. And so theoretically, I could have a SQL Server installed on an Azure VM that's in the West US data center. And then I've got a gateway either on that same machine or in another Azure VM in the West US data center. And now you've gotten rid of the internet latency because they're all in the same data center, so they don't have to go very far. So that's gonna help you with performance as well. So that gets rid of some of that latency. So those are probably the best things I can mention in terms of making direct query perform faster. Outside of saying reducing your columns or data. <laughs> um, do you have any experience on best practices regarding the amount of tables for one gateway, when to split them? So I actually updated a limitation in a doc yesterday. Um, I just found out about this earlier this week. There's a limitation in the Power BI service that you can only have a maximum of 16,000 columns across all of your tables in a data set. And so the other thing with that is that Power BI reserves a single column on every table for a internal row ID. And so if you have 100 tables, 
your available columns are only 15,900 because we're taking up 100 of those. And so if you have 1,500 tables, well, now you're potentially going to hit a limit on number of columns you can have. Um, so in terms of the number of tables, it, I, I don't know that there's necessarily a limit on that. You're going to hit that column limit before you hit a table limit. So um, just be aware of that. Uh, do, 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 do. Is there any plan to improve work on the direct queries to support data intelligence functions like an import? Uh, not sure necessarily. Are you talking about Power Query with the data sources? I'm not sure what you mean by that. I, I do know that there is some work to um, uh, allow some functionality. A lot of people have been asking for, like, can I create my own measures or stuff on an analysis services live connection? Um, I know that we're looking at that, um, but I, I don't know when that'll all happen. Um, uh, I, I do know that it's harder when we talk about direct query, so I don't know what's coming on that front with regards to that. I don't know if that's what you meant. Uh, I always get this question a bit off topic. How many rows Power BI supports in one gigabyte? Uh, for example, Luminary SAP has 15,000 as cell limits means one row and one column data in one cell. From a Power BI perspective, uh, it depends because we get all of that information. So when we're talking about limits, row limits inside of Power BI, when we query stuff from an analysis services perspective and from an imported data set perspective, uh, we have a hard set limit on a thousand rows or a million rows uh, on that. So if you look at a profiler trace on queries that are being issued, uh, you'll see that it's like a top one million type request, you'll see that in there. It'll actually say 1 million and 1, um, but that's the limit that you'll have from a Power BI perspective. Analysis Services actually has that same limitation, but you can configure it with an on-premises analysis services so you can increase it. But for Power BI, you can't. Um, and so Power BI does have that limit. Uh, the, oh, uh, we were still working. So the question was, can I provide a link to that document? I talked about the table limit. We're still working on where to list this holistically for the service, but I stuck it in. The customer that hit this was dealing with Spark specifically, so I stuck it in the Spark article for right now, and we're trying to figure out where else is a good spot to put it. So that is under, where is it? Data from databases, and then HD, no, there should be a Spark one. Yeah, Spark on HD Insight. Uh, and then if you go to limitations, you'll see it right there. So that's where that is. I'll put that link in the chat as well. That is fresh, hot off the press. I deployed that at like 6 p.m. Central Time last night. So um, it's actually been there since the beginning. Um, it's just that for the Spark people, they hit that really fast because of what they were doing in their model. So. Anything else? All right, you guys are easy. And <laughs> quiet, yeah. <laughs> Any recommendations of the server configuration where Gateway is installed? So uh, I keep closing the documentation, but I keep going back to it. In terms of what we have as minimum requirements, uh, I will I can tell you what's listed in the documentation. Um, that is listed in the documentation. Um, it, you may you may have kind of like a holy cow that's like eight gig for the Gateway. I, I don't know that it needs eight gig. Um, we listed these requirements, first off, because people were asking, what are the requirements for the gateway? Um, I will tell you that this was copied directly from the .NET requirements. Um, and so uh, there's no, it it's really depends on a lot of factors. So it depends on the number of data sources you have, the number of users that are going through it. If you're just testing this on a machine, like on your own machine, uh, it's definitely not going to take up 8 gig of RAM unless you're running like some super huge like testing stuff through it, um, but uh, it's 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 pretty. It's going to be whatever data is going through the gateway up to the Power BI service. Um, so now, if you have, say, if you have a hundred data sources configured on the gateway and you're running, you know, two thousand users or five thousand users through it, 
it's probably going to take 8 gig of memory depending on how much data is funneling through it because we have to copy that data from your data source. It's piping through the gateway, and so it's going to eat up memory as part of that as it's piping out to the socket out to the Internet. Um, so just be aware of that. And so that's where the performance counters and the uh, the log tracing, that's where all of that comes in is you want to monitor that. Um, and so if you do know that you have a large user base and you're getting large, maybe you're seeing performance degradation on direct query or live connections or your schedule refreshes are airing out, I would start looking at perf counters and start looking at those logs and saying, okay, how much load is coming through this thing? Um, and then, you know, if I have that hundred data sources on the gateway, maybe that's when I start thinking about I need to set up another machine with another gateway and move maybe half of those off to another gateway. Um, so those are things you can start looking at. But always figure out what your baseline is and then figure out where you're at today. All right. I think that's it. No one else is typing. I think uh, you did an amazing presentation, Adam, and <laughs> answering those questions. So we don't have that, that many questions. <laughs> but um, I think uh, the present presentation was really good and to the topic. So uh, we're going to make all the materials available. So we're going to try to yep. put this uh, video and, and, and the presentation. If you can share the presentation with us, we can yep. share it with the with all the user groups. So thank you for taking the time and yep. hopefully like we have like uh, another presentation with you pretty soon. Yep. And then uh, the other thing is if you guys have any follow up questions or anything comes up, you can always reach out to me on Twitter. I've got my email address here as well. Twitter's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Um, and also that helps share it out with other people in the community. Um, but those are the Twitter is probably the biggest thing I pay attention to. So um, I do pay attention on the other platform. I, I do respond to comments on my YouTube videos, but that's probably not where you're going to engage me. Um, but yeah, if you send me an email, I'll get to it as well. Um, but probably not as quickly as I will on Twitter. So. That sounds good. Uh, so for now we uh, gonna the the finalize the presentation. Thank you everybody for attending to this presentation. And like Adam say, uh, if you guys want to reach out to him, so you can follow on Twitter, Facebook, or you can go to the YouTube channel, Guy in the Cube, and you can find like a lot of information in there. Thank you everyone. Thanks guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.